Welcome to the Nova Biomedical Educational Webinar Series. Today's webinar is titled Cardiopulmonary Resuscitation and Blood Gas Sampling. Our presenter today is Dr. Jake Wolf, an emergency and critical care resident at the University of Pennsylvania Veterinary Hospital in Philadelphia. He is a graduate of Cornell University College of Veterinary Medicine. Prior to Cornell, Dr. Wolf worked as a nurse in veterinary hospitals in the Washington, D.C. area for two years. His clinical interests include teaching, exotics, clinical pathology, and hemodynamics. Today's program is race approved to offer a total of one CE credit to any one of veterinarian or veterinary technicians. After the webinar, you will receive an email with directions for obtaining CE credits. Dr. Wolf will be available after his presentation for questions and answers. Dr. Wolf? Welcome to today's webinar entitled Cardiopulmonary Resuscitation and Blood Gas Sampling during CPR. And thank you for tuning in. My name is Jake Wolf. Um, and as you heard, I am a uh, first-year emergency and critical care veterinarian at the University of Pennsylvania. And I look forward to any questions you might have at the end of the presentation. Just as a brief overview, this presentation will cover five steps um, or five different components of cardiopulmonary resuscitation. First, recognition of cardiopulmonary arrest. Second, basic life support. Third, advanced life support. Fourth, blood gas monitoring as a component of advanced life support. And then finally, things that we can do in practice to prepare for a cardiopulmonary arrest. Recognition of cardiopulmonary arrest in an unresponsive patient usually focuses on three things, your ABCs. It's important to remember that ABCs is for recognition of cardiopulmonary arrest, not for the initiation of interventions for patients with cardiopulmonary arrest, as CPR is not done in the same order. So for your ABCs, the first thing you'll examine for a patient is their airway to look for any upper airway obstruction. Next, next you will look to see if the patient is breathing. Um, however, Breathing, agonal breaths are not included as breathing, and if a patient is agonally breathing um, and has no palpable pulses, CPR should be initiated. And finally, circulation. Um, so examining a patient's palpable pulses or palpable heart, uh, apex heartbeat to um, see if there are signs consistent with arrest. It's important to remember that pulse palpation at least in humans, is notoriously unreliable. Um, and it is usually safer to administer CPR if uncertain. Indeed, serious adverse effects, uh, effects have occurred in less than 2% of human patients who are not in cardiopulmonary arrest that received chest compressions. The incidence of cardiopulmonary arrest during anesthesia or sedation during veterinary medicine is 0.17% in dogs and 0.24% in cats. This is not a, um, it, it is definitely something that every veterinarian, including general practitioners and specialists, should be aware of. In people, a three-phase model of cardiopulmonary arrest is described, and based on which stage a patient falls, um, treatment is uh, is based on on the phase in which they in which they're classified. So the first phase um, is the electrical phase, which is the first four minutes after cardiopulmonary arrest, and this is characterized by minimal ischemia. Um, due to the acute onset. In this phase, if a patient has a shockable rhythm, such as pulseless ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, defibrillation is the most important treatment and can be initiated without compression, chest compressions prior to the defibrillation. The second phase is the circulatory phase, which is um, characterized as minutes four through 10 after arrest. 
This is where energy depletion and reversible cellular damage occurs. And during this phase, oxygen delivery is most important. Therefore, regardless of whether a patient has a shockable rhythm or not, a cycle of chest compressions is important to deliver oxygen to the tissues. And finally, the last phase is the metabolic phase, which is um, a rest over 10 minutes. And this is when ischemic injury occurs that requires advanced strategies to recover cellular function. During this time, gut mucosal translocation of gram-negative bacteria may also occur and result in endotoxin and cytokine-induced um, suppression of myocardial function after defibrillation if there's a shockable rhythm um, present. A number of strategies have been postulated to benefit during the metabolic phase, um, such as protective strategies like cardiopulmonary bypass and um, therapeutic hypothermia in people, though, no, though, though none of these have shown a significant benefit and are probably not currently feasible in our veterinary patients. The 2012 Recover Guidelines in the Journal of Veterinary Emergency and Critical Care introduce the standards for cardiopulmonary resuscitation in veterinary medicine. These will likely be updated in the coming years, but they outline two separate components of CPR that, uh, that occur at the same time, basic life support and advanced life support. These basic life support and advanced life support cover all four rest rhythms that we see in veterinary patients, including asystole, pulseless electrical activity, ventricular fibrillation, and pulseless ventricular tachycardia. Basic life support consists of initiation of immediate chest compressions and establishment of ventilatory access and initiation of ventilation. And it's important to note that basic life support is the most important por portion of CPR. Advanced life support consists of monitoring through electrocardiogram, end tidal CO2, and venous blood gases, establishment of vascular access, and administration of various therapies, including reversal agents, vasopressors and atropine, defibrillation, and antiarrhythmics if indicated. Increased return of spontaneous circulation has been noted with open chest CPR, um, especially for patients under anesthesia or already in hospital. But there is unknown timing of when to begin this, whether it should be initiated immediately or after 10 to 20 minutes of therapy. Certainly, it's indicated in certain diseases, such as pleural space disease and chest wall disease, where um, chest compressions are not going to offer significant benefit, or when you're doing thoracic surgery and already have access to the heart, or abdominal surgery, where you can readily incise through the diaphragm and directly compress the heart. However, because it often requires intensive monitoring after and surgery, um, including a thoracotomy to flush the, the chest and pleural space, I will not be discussing it further in this lecture. This is the algorithm uh, created by Recover um, that guides your response to an unresponsive apneic patient, um, and it shows that Immediately, basic life support is initiated, including chest compressions and ventilation, and then advanced life support is started as long as you have enough team members concurrently, which includes initiation of monitoring, vascular access, and administration of reversals if indicated, um, and then evaluation of the ECG to decide upon further therapies, whether vasopressors, antiarrhythmics, or defibrillation. I'll give you a moment to look over that. Let's first discuss chest compression technique. There are two theories that discuss the proper form for chest compressions, the thoracic pump theory and the cardiac pump theory. The cardiac pump theory is more intuitive and holds that compression directly over the heart causes compression of the ventricles and thus the outflow of blood. And Utilization of this technique 
means that you would place your hands directly over where the patient's heart would be. This technique is practiced in cats, small breed dogs, and deep chested dogs, dogs like greyhounds, sighthounds. The thoracic pump theory holds that for uh, delivery of compression over the widest portion of the chest will secondarily cause compression of the ventricles and outflow of blood. And this technique is thought to work best in wider chested breeds like Labradors, your large and other large breed and medium breed dogs. A modulation of this theory works in um, barrel chested breeds like French Bulldogs, Bulldogs, and Pugs that may benefit from being in dorsal recumbency um, and have chest compressions delivered similar to a human. Whereas most other spe uh, breeds of dogs and cats will be benefit from being in left or right lateral recumbency. The goal of chest compressions is to maximize cardiac output. Of course, in a patient who has suffered a cardiopulmonary arrest and you initiate CPR in them, you will not attain for full cardiac output. And really, the best that we can achieve in these patients is usually 25 to 35 percent of a patient's cardiac output. Your chest compressions technique will depend on a number of factors, and we'll cover each of them briefly. The first, the first is the depth of compressions delivered. Studies done in pigs have shown um, that the depth of compression um, is positively correlated with a patient's cardiac output and mean aortic pressure. Um, and studies in dogs have de uh, demonstrated that cardiac output and mean arterial pressure increase linearly with sternal chest compressions between um, 25 and 60 centimeters. Importantly for these dogs, um, compressions less than 23 centimeters, where the chest was compressed less than that amount, there was no cardiac output or mean arterial pressure. Other studies have shown that increased depth of compressions associated were, are associated with an increased rate of successful defibrillation and return of spontaneous um, circulation, and therefore it is important to go about a third to a half of the patient's chest depth when compressing. Additionally, recoil must be allowed to fully occur as this is when the heart will fill with blood and when myocardial perfusion occurs. So it's important not to lean on your patient in between compressions. Positioning of your patient is uh, also important during chest compressions. And numerous studies have demonstrated higher left ventricular pressure and aortic flow in dogs who are placed in lateral rather than dorsal recumbency um, and have demonstrated a higher likelihood of return of spontaneous circulation. Again, your exception may be your barrel-chested brachycephalics who may be benefit from being in dorsal recumbency. The rate of chest compressions is probably the most variable and the most important part of your chest compressions. Studies of dogs um, with induced ventricular fibrillation showed a higher return of spontaneous circulation and survival with 120 beats per minute rather than 60 compressions per minute. Indeed, improved cardiac output and stable um, coronary perfusion and cerebral blood flow were noted as hot with um, rates as high as 150 in dogs. Um, this, along with the, the depth of compressions, has led to the, um, the uh, statement in human medicine of push hard and push fast. Um, and like I mentioned, with your rate, while you're, you are aiming for 100 to 120 compressions per minute, it is important to not go so quickly that you do not allow complete chest recoil, as again, that's when myocardial perfusion will occur. Interposed abdominal compression, where you 
have um, one person compressing the chest and then the other person compressing the abdomen um, to uh, during periods of diastole um, to increase blood flow into the heart um, has occasionally been demonstrated. And a number of studies in dogs has showed increased blood flow, blood pressures, and cardiac output, and blood flow to the brain with using this method compared to standard CPR. However, that study did not show any benefit to survival to discharge for these patients. Two human studies, however, have shown increased survival to discharge with interposed abdominal compressions. And if you have enough team members, this is something that could be considered. And finally, cycle length is the other very important component for chest compressions in dogs and cats. So studies in pigs have shown that it takes approximately 60 seconds of continuous compressions to build up to a maximum cerebral perfusion pressure, and any pauses are associated with an immediate decrease in blood flow to the brain. Therefore, compressors must be, you do not obtain adequate flow until 60 seconds of compression. Um, studies in humans have shown that two minutes of uninterrupted compressions with only brief rhythm checks significantly improve survival and neurologic st status. And finally, fatigue is an important thing to keep in mind. So studies in uh, using mannequin models have shown that the depth of compressions decline after 90 seconds despite feedback to the compressor. And fatigue usually begins one minute after initi initiation. Importantly, compressors were poorly able to identify when fatigue was occurring in themselves, and there was a decrease in correct compressions, defined as hand position and compression depth, from 93% at one minute, 67% at two minutes, 39% at three minutes, and 18% at five minutes. That is a huge drop-off after two minutes, um, and therefore that is why cycles are recommended to be two minutes in length. So one compressor for two minutes, and then a switch is made. The other component of basic life support is ventilation. The importance of ventilation has been debated significantly in human medicine recently, um, and veterinary medicine to an extent as well. There is evidence in human pediatric patients that ventilation is more important in patients with cardiopulmonary arrest, not of primary cardiac origin. And therefore, since most of our patients suffer a primary respiratory arrest, ventilation may be more important in our patients. Um, hypoxemia, hypercapnia, and hyperoxia have all been shown to negatively impact survival and neurologic status following cardiopulmonary arrest. Thus, um, demonstrating the importance of proper uh, ventilation. There's two components to ventilation. The first one is respiratory rate and the second tidal volume. Um, in looking at respiratory rate, um, studies in animals have demonstrated that um, comparing compression only to 10 breaths per minute um, ventilation, those that were ventilated had an improved outcome. And similarly, in human studies, those who were ventilated had shorter time to return a spontaneous circulation, a higher pH, and increase end tidal CO2. Um, again, studies in animals have demonstrated that 10 breaths per minute improve blood flow to the brain and heart, and um, do have a shorter duration to return a spontaneous circulation when compared to other ventilatory rates. Um, and studies in pigs have demonstrated the inferiority of both hyperventilation, defined as 20 to 30 breaths per minute, and hypoventilation, defined as three breaths per minute. Um, so therefore, it is important to aim for about 10 breaths per minute or one breath every six seconds. Um, again, in human medicine, the debate occurs largely because of the difficulty in intubation um, of people. However, since our patients are easily intubated, we can easily intubate them, hook them up to an end tidal CO2, and then the AMBU bag on the other end, hook up um, oxygen to the AMBU bag, and give our patients 100% um, oxygen via an AMBU bag.
Um, the aim for tidal volume uh, is usually recommended um, about 10 milliliters per kilogram. Um, however, one study in pigs did demonstrate that there is no difference between 12 milliliters per kilogram and 6 milliliters per kilogram in assessing when they obtained return of spontaneous circulation. So respiratory rate is probably the more um, important factor when ventilating your, your arrest patients. Let's now move on to advanced life support. So after obtaining venous access, you may uh, want to decide to administer various drugs. Um, the aim of many drugs is to optimize coronary perfusion pressure, which is the difference between the diastolic aortic and the right atrial pressure. And maximizing this aids in restoring myocardial function. Most studies for drugs look at um, vasopressors, epinephrine being a primary vasopressor. Um, there are rare studies in sh humans that have shown improved survival um, for, after epinephrine use, after prolonged CPR. Most studies are neutral or equivocal, although some studies also show worse outcomes um, after epinephrine administration. Studies in dogs showed um, with pulseless electrical activity showed no difference between low and high dose epinephrine after 10 minutes of arrest um, and no difference for dogs with ventricular fibrillation in return of spontaneous circulation, although low dose epinephrine took longer to resuscitate those patients. Generally, the consensus is that low dose should be administered um, every other cycle. So every four minutes um, it, for the, in the first 10 minutes, and then after that, um, consider switching to high-dose epinephrine. With high-dose epinephrine, there is a greater risk of um, worse outcomes, such as severe tachycardia and tachyarrhythmias, um, hypertension, and neurologic abnormalities. Epinephrine can also be administered intratracheal, um, although it does have unknown absorption during cardiopulmonary arrest. The way that this is done is you take a long red rubber catheter um, and insert it through the endotracheal tube, flush high-dose epinephrine and five milliliters of sterile water. And that will ideally be absorbed by the um, epithelium, the respiratory epithelium. Um, other vasopressors, such as vasopressin, have been looked at for resuscitation. Most human studies develop, uh, demonstrate a mixed report. Um, the largest veterinary study showed no benefit in dogs compared to epinephrine. Um, and there's some thought that um, its effectiveness may depend on arrest rhythm in human medicine. Atropine, um, there is very little evidence for its use, uh, but it may have a theoretical benefit in our patients, especially since veterinary patients may have more vagal arrest episodes than human, human patients. Atropine may also give, be given intratracheally. And for these drugs, for vasopressors and atropine, as well as the reversals that I'll get to in a moment, it's important to remember to flush a significant amount of saline after administration of these drugs. Um, if you think of our arrest patients, their venous system is not functioning properly, and so you need to be able to flush the, um, the drug from its peripheral vein into its heart um, and need to use more than like a three milliliter flush that would, you would normally um, use in a patient. You may need to use um, 10 to 15 mils, depending on the size of the patient. Oxygen is a necessary component of um, CPR and should be administered immediately to patients. Although there is a risk of hyperoxia due to the formation of um, free oxygen radicals, the risk of hypoxemia is probably greater. And as we'll discuss later, you can monitor blood gases to check for um, hyperoxia. Antiarrhythmics may be of benefit in um, <clears throat> patients who have um, an arrest rhythm that could respond to an antiarrhythmic, 
um, such as pulseless ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation if they are not responding to defibrillation. In human medicine, it's thought that amiodarone may show the most promise for shock-resistant V-fib and pulseless ventricular tachycardia, um, although lidocaine can also be considered. You should have reversals for any of your possible um, uh, sedatives. Um, and if you are uncertain if a patient has received them, they should be administered. So this includes um, adipamazole for dexmedetomidine. And remember, in most, um, you probably most commonly administer this drug intramuscularly, but in a, an arrest situation, it should be administered IV. Flumazenil for your benzodiazepines and naloxone for your opioids. Intravenous fluids are only really indicated for a patient who is arrested due to hypovolemia um, as administering them to a normal volemic or hypervolemic patient will increase your central venous pressure and can decrease coronary perfusion secondary to that. Steroids have been postulated on an experimental level but have not shown benefit in any clinical studies in humans or veterinary patients and thus are um, probably should not be administered. Bicarbonate can be considered. Um, two veterinary studies found that with prolonged ventricular fibrillation, so uh, arrests greater than 10 minutes, dogs receiving CPR with bicarbonate had a higher rate and shorter interval of retain, return of spontaneous circulation than those without. However, other studies have found no positive effect. The most common um, method for bicarbonate administration is um, consider it after 10 minutes of CPR, um, and you can also base this um, on your blood gas, and if your patient is severely acidemic with a pH of less than 7, you may consider bicarbonate administration. Um, it's important that, to note that bicarbonate cannot be given intratracheally. It's important to Note the role of defibrillation in patients with cardiopulmonary arrest. So here we have our four arrest rhythms going from top to bottom, pulseless electrical activity, um, asystole, pulseless ventricular tachycardia, and ventricular fibrillation. And um, again, only the bottom two are responsive to defibrillation. It's now thought that biphasic defibrillators are safer and more efficacious than monophasic defibrillators, and so most are transitioning over to the biphasic route. The current recommendation in human medicine is to avoid stacked shocks, so multiple shocks in a row, um, to minimize interrupt, interruptions and in chest compressions. So if you do shock a patient, you would defibrillate them and then um, immediately begin compressions again. You would not do multiple in a row. Um, as we discussed, if you have a shockable rhythm, if the arrest has been less than four minutes, so if it's a witnessed arrest, then you may, may immediately defibrillate and then begin compressions. However, if the arrest is longer than four minutes, you should do a cycle of compressions before defibrillating the patient. Um, and that's due to the myocardial ischemia that has occurred in greater than four minutes, and so you want to better perfuse a heart before shocking it. Now let's discussion, begin our discussion about the monitoring that can occur during an arrest situation. First, it's important to note there is no benefit for obtaining a pulse ox um, or a blood pressure during cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And there have been no studies on corneal um, Doppler flow. Um, and there is the warning in the recovered guidelines that placing the Doppler on the cornea may detect retrograde venous flow and may not, um, and therefore may trick you that um, <clears throat> adequate pulses are being detected. Monitoring usually re 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 uh, revolves around three components. ECG, end-tidal CO2, and blood gas sampling. 
for electrocardiogram, this can be helpful by identifying the arrest rhythm. It's important that this is only examined between the time it ch um, between cycle changes and the time that it changes for a compressor, as it may take up to two minutes of CPR to reestablish um, adequate blood flow to the brain following interruptions. So when you trade out your compressor, people should be looking at the ECG and saying what rhythm they see and identifying whether everyone agrees with that assessment. And compression should immediately be reinitiated. No pause should occur to be examining the ECG. I think it's easy to get disheartened with CPR since the mortality rate is so high. Um, but it's important to remember that most of our patients su suffer asystole or pulseless electrical activity as arrest rhythms. And even in human medicine, there's a dismal prognosis for asystole and a very poor prognosis for pulseless electrical activity. So it's therefore not things that we are doing incorrectly, but the nature of our patients' arrests, who usually have systemic diseases causing arrest rather than primary myocardial disease. The end tidal CO2 is extremely helpful um, for monitoring your patient. Um, it can be an indicator of proper endotracheal um, tube placement. So to note that you are not in the patient's esophagus, it can be a prognostic indicator, and it can indicate when return of spontaneous circulation occurs. A few notes, a low end tidal CO2 may be encountered despite appropriate endotracheal tube placement. However, a study in dogs uh, showed that no dogs with esophageal intubation achieved an end tidal above 11, while all properly intubated dogs achieved an end tidal of greater than 13. In dogs, also, the mean highest recorded end tidal was higher in dogs that, received, uh, that achieved return of spontaneous circulation. Um, it was 36 than those that did not. Um, importantly, 86% of dogs with values of an end title of greater than 15 during chest compressions achieved a return of spontaneous circulation, where 94% of dogs with an end title of less than 15 did not achieve ROSC. Similarly, um, 90% of cats with an end title of greater than 20 achieved return of spontaneous circulation. Um, a study looking at pediatric dogs undergoing CPR, um, their mean end title um, during CPR was 12, which increased suddenly to 27 just prior to or at the return of spontaneous circulation. Pulse palpation may also be done between um, cycles when you're swapping out um, compressors to see if there is an identifiable pul pulse. However, it's important to note that this is a notoriously unreliable, and it can be very hard to truly detect pulse pressure um, in patients that have uh, undergoing CPR. Now let's discuss blood gas sampling in patients with cardiopulmonary arrest. It's important to note that blood gases may be normal in early cardiopulmonary arrest, and so delayed sampling might be best. And these samples can be examined not only for um, uh, pH status, but also for electrolytes, ventilatory status, and hyperoxemia. There's a longstanding debate um, in human medicine about whether arterial or venous sampling is best for a blood gas. Certainly in our patients, especially when they're dead, a venous sample is far easier to obtain unless you have a patient who is already under anesthesia with an arterial line in place, which doesn't happen all too frequently. Venous samples are a more reliable indicator of tissue oxygenation status than an arterial sample is. This a, lot, a venous sample will more accurately re reflect tissue, tissue acid base balance than the arterial value. Um, and studies in human medicines, uh, human medicine have um, looked at defibrillation response um, in experimental studies for venous versus arterial pH, and it seems like governing them based on venous pH is more successful. Studies in humans have demonstrated um, increased survival for patients who have a higher PaO2 and a higher pH during 
um, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, and therefore you may use your blood gases to adjust those values by increasing your PaO2 or increasing your pH. It's important to remember that a high CO2 in these patients does not indicate hypoventilation in patients undergoing CPR. So if you have a patient with a high CO2, you do not increase their respiratory rate based on that PVCO2. It instead indicates tissue accumulation of um, carbon dioxide and a lack of cardiac output. And therefore, you should increase your cardiac output, most likely by increasing the rate of your compressions and the depth of your compressions. Studies in humans looking at venous blood gases at ER admission demonstrated that um, patients with a CO2 of less than 75 were almost three and a half times more likely to achieve return of spontaneous circulation than those with ones over 75. And also importantly, none of the neurologically intact patients who were resuscitated had pH levels below 6.8. Intraosseous um, blood gases can also be performed. Um, studies have looked at the use of intraosseous blood gases in um, people, um, and they can be used for certain values. So intraosseous blood gases can likely be used to exclude significant hypocalcemia, hyponatremia, or hypoxemia, and they're reliable for um, pH, lactate, and blood glucose. However, the potassium and hematocrit are completely unreliable um, for uh, osseous, intraosseous samples. Again, these studies were done in human medicine, not veterinary medicine, so further studies would be needed to confirm that. There is one clinical, clinical veterinary study looking at blood gas sampling during CPR. They did not notice a difference in those that achieved return of spontaneous circulation and those that did achieve it um, before or after 15 minutes of CPR based on any of the blood gas values that they looked at, other than, um, and only the pH and venous PO2 were different between CPR patients and immediately post return of spontaneous circulation. In this study, they noted that all patients had a metabolic acidosis secondary to a hyperlactatemia, and the vast majority also had a respiratory acidosis and a hyperkalemia. Carboxyhemoglobin may be a point of further study in veterinary patients and in human medicine um, for those who have cooximeters in their blood gas units. Studies in human medicine have demonstrated that carboxyhemoglobin was significantly increased in surviving humans compared to non-surviving humans. And this is likely due to carboxyhemoglobin's ability to attenuate ischemia reperfusion injury post-return of spontaneous circulation. And finally, lactate may be a prognostic indicator. In humans, a serum lactate measured during CPR does correlate with survival outcomes and a lactate level of nine um, is used to identify patients with different survival probabilities um, and determine the optimal CPR dur duration. So a first serum lactate of greater than nine is associated with a higher mortality. This was not demonstrated in the, that um, clinical veterinary study. Um, an, ex an experimental study in dogs did demonstrate that five minutes of CPR was needed um, before reliable lactate values were obtained, um, as prior to that, they indicate non-circulating blood lactate concentrations and could be normal or barely elevated. And then finally, one human study did demonstrate a significant increase in lactate in non-survivors, which increased linearly with um, the duration of CPR compared to non-survivors. Electrolytes may all be examined, also be examined during a blood gas analysis. And this may demonstrate um, changes in mainly these three items, so potassium, ionized calcium, and blood glucose, but it may also identify causes of the rest, 
of the arrest, such as a hypoglycemia, hypocalcemia, or hyperkalemia, which al may allow you to treat for those disorders. Let's touch on potassium first. Potassium levels may increase significantly during CPR due to cell rupture, um, secondary to ischemia. Um, and uh, potassium of greater than 8 has been associated with a lack of return of spontaneous circulation in both dogs and people. Therefore, treatment um, with a potassium over 8 may improve outcome. Serum potassium increases by nearly 10% per minute uh, of arrest with CPR, and a respiratory acidosis will also worsen hyperkalemia. It's important to know that in studies in humans, none of the neurologi neurologically intact patients at discharge had excessive potassium levels greater than 8.5 during CPR. Ionized cal hypocalcemia is very common in people, people secondary to arrest, and it's recommended that severe hypocalcemia should be treated. However, um, that clinical study that I mentioned did not document um, severe hypocalcemia in dogs. Also, administration of calcium automatically can be helpful, and there's very little um, research in human or veterinary medicine for its prophylactic or empiric use. In one study in pigs, administration of calcium in hypocalcemic pigs did improve myocardial function. And so in those that are hypocalcemic, administration of calcium is indicated. Finally, um, blood glucose in humans, usually um, a significant hyperglycemia is noted, um, and blood glucose um, in these studies increases from a normal level pre-arrest to a mean of 230 after 8 to 12 minutes of CPR. In people, tight glucose control post-return of spontaneous circulation is important. Its role is unknown in veterinary patients. The clinical study that I mentioned um, in dogs did show a high number of return of spontaneous circulation in hypoglycemic patients in this study, which is in contrast to human medicine. There have been a number of updates since the recover guidelines came out, a number of new studies that I briefly want to touch on. A recent study out of UC Davis showed that orotracheal intubation in dogs is um, likely the best form of providing ventilation. Um, and after that, face ma a tight face mask, mouth to smout, and compression only. Um, are in order of decreasing um, the most efficacious ways of providing ventilation. Um, it's thought that the face mask, mouth to smout, and compression only are potentially worse due to the lower PaO2 levels and the greater number of side effects, such as um, gastric distension, regurgitation. A Japanese study uh, in veterinary medicine compared traditional um, CPR, so um, providing airway, breathing, and then compressions to the new recover guidelines where compressions are initiated immediately and then um, ventilation has begun after. And in these patients, they noted 17% um, had return of spontaneous circulation for the traditional recommendations and 43% um, achieved ROSC using the recover guidelines with a difference of zero surviving for the traditional and 5% surviving to discharge in the, in the other. Again, those are not great numbers, um, but they are consistent with kind of the 5 to 10% survival to discharge for patients who suffer um, an arrest. Um, a study in JVAC also did show that a higher end title um, corresponded to a return of spontaneous circulation in dogs and cats with an end title of greater than 18, very sensitive for return of spontaneous circulation, and one greater than 10 as a reasonable cutoff. So those below 10 are very unlikely to receive, um, achieve return of spontaneous circulation. Four minutes, three through eight. Um, so it's important those first two minutes um, it's harder to interpret the end title during those first two minutes. You should wait until the third minute to assess. Interestingly, this study demonstrated that the median time to return a spontaneous circulation was nine minutes, 
Um, so potentially don't give up on your patients too early. Um, I, I think that's a, a common thing that, that, we, that we do even here. Continued studies have looked at different vasopressors, so the epinephrine versus vasopressin debates. Um, <clears throat> one study in China demonstrated that um, administration of epinephrine improved short-term survival and return of spontaneous circulation. However, there was no benefit on survival to discharge or those with a favorable neur neurologic outcome after um, out-of-hospital administration of epinephrine. Um, and a study in pigs looking at vasopressin administration showed that only epinephrine increased return of spontaneous circulation, although vasopressin did maintain a prolonged pressure effect after administration. <clears throat> and it also um, inhibited neuronal apoptosis during CPR, whether with epinephrine in conjunction with epinephrine or alone. So it may have beneficial um, effects for the brain. Lastly, um, Studies in humans looking at out-of-hospital cardiopulmonary arrest showed for compression rate, return of spontaneous circulation peaked at 125 compressions per minute, and then um, at compression rates higher than that, um, return of sp spontaneous circulation declined. So something to keep in mind about potentially not going for faster rates than 120 compressions per minute, as this may um, decrease your chest compression depth, lead to earlier fatigue, um, or allow, disallow the chest from fully recoiling. So what can you do in your own hospitals to be ready for an arrest when it happens? First, having a crash car or a crash drawer can be um, important so every all staff knows where to go um, when there is an arrest, knows where supplies are, and to give you a central location for trying to get your patient back. Possible supplies um, to include in your crash car include endotracheal tubes of all sizes, laryngoscopes, again, multiple size blades, endotracheal tube ties, a cuff syringe, um, drugs, including reversals, atropine, epinephrine, lidocaine, and ambu bags are all important to have readily available. It's also important to have a clear delineation of roles, especially leadership roles during CPR. So usually the most experienced person, whether that's a veterinary nurse or a veterinarian, will take on the leadership role and give instructions to everyone else. And it's important that, they, that everyone looks to that individual for what the next steps are for that person and gives people um, roles such as the compressor, the ventilator, a recorder, someone to get drugs, someone getting IV access. Um, <clears throat> the um, individual should also um, keep track of time to let people know when switches will occur. Periodic recover training for all those involved using um, a dummy may be helpful um, as long as they are evidence-based scenarios um, and, and are using mock arrest scenarios. This training may be especially important for new employees since people do tend to gravitate to CPR and it's important that they know what they're doing and are utilized property, properly. Um, additionally, training for the use of specific instruments such as a defibrillator or the ECG or an end title is important so that someone during the arrest will know how to use each of those instruments um, and to minimize kind of fumbling around and delay of, of treatments during that time. Um, and then finally, following an arrest, it's important to debrief. So to gather together um, and kind of go over what as a group you think went well for the arrest and what things could be worked on for the following arrest and to take that feedback um, to heart um, to make corrections to improve outcomes for, for further patients. And these are my references. Thank you very much for listening to the, this presentation, and I will now gladly take any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Wolf, for your presentation. A uh, couple things. Yeah. First of all, people who are interested in asking questions, uh, there's a Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, type the questions in and we'll read the questions and Dr. Wolf can then answer them.
in the meantime, just as a reminder, a follow-up email will be sent to you as a registrant. Uh, and that follow-up email will have all the information you need regarding the continuing education credits, a link to a survey that also then links to a uh, certificate of participation. So, so far there's been two questions, so I'll read those questions to Dr. Wolf and uh, feel free to ask questions get to as many as we can. Uh, so the first question is, do you have any staff training recommendations for blood gas use with CPR? Um, so I would say it's um, at, at our institution, we run a lot, pretty much every patient who comes through the ER will receive a blood gas. Um, and um, most patients in the ICU will receive one, one or more blood gases per day. Um, so we run them pretty frequently um, and don't do any, uh, I guess, regular training for um, interpretation. I'm at, I'm at an academic institution, so um, other than with the students and rounding on those, we, we don't do any active training for it. Um, I think if you don't do them often enough, it, the big things to remind your staff and remind yourself are of, is um, processing them quickly. Um, not letting them sit, especially uncapped, so that you don't get um, false readings due to the uh, mixing with atmospheric air, um, and um, and knowing what sort of tube you need to have them in, um, which is dependent on what analyzer you're you're using. Um, we did do a previous arterial blood gas sampling webinar that's on Nova's website um, that you guys can take a look at um, for like a further discussion of both. Um, arterial and venous blood gas sampling, um, but we don't in our institution do any active training on processing it. I would say our normal protocol for patients who have undergo cardiopulmonary arrest um, is um, as someone is beginning chest compressions and then as a different person is intubating, um, the third person will work on venous access if that patient doesn't have it already. Um, and if the patient does not initially have venous access, as soon as it's gained, we'll draw um, a sample and run a blood gas at the time of arrest. Um, and then we'll usually do so about 10 minutes later if we're continuing CPR. Um, if the patient does already have a sample, uh, does already have a catheter, then we'll try to bleed back from that. Um, and if that does not bleed back, then we'll draw a new sample, usually again at the time of arrest and then 10 to 15 minutes later if we're continuing a prolonged CPR scenario. Uh, next question: Do you have any? Do you have specific values on venous blood gases that you feel are key? Um, so is that um, specific, like the specific readings or the specific like ranges? Sorry, what was that question? Uh, do you have specific values on venous blood gas that you feel are key? Um, I guess. The the main values that I look for look at in a um, venous blood gas in an arrest scenario are the PVCO2, um, which we would expect to be elevated, um, and the best prognosis is usually in human medicine at least between 60 and 70 is what I've seen for a venous blood gas. Um, certainly, significantly higher that gives me gives me pause. Um, and in a live patient, we, of course, want those right around 40. Um, we usually pay pretty close attention to lactate um, with ideal levels in, in most situations less than two and a half. Um, but in either arrest or um, in resuscitation, we at least want to see a decrease um, during resuscitation um, in lactate. Um, and then kind of the, the other ones that I mentioned, so certainly your, your blood glucose, um, your potassium, as I mentioned, um, in an arrest situation, higher or lower than eight in human medicine can um, give prognos prognostic information. Um, I would say in, a, in an arrest patient, those are the most common ones we look at. Um, certainly in, in other patients, if we're doing an arterial sample, it's great to get a PaO2 and a patient off of oxygen, having it between 80 and 100. I'm usually pretty comfortable with that, even if a patient's recovering from anesthesia. 
I'm I'm okay with a, a 70 and might just put them on some flow by um, if they have some atelectasis or something like that. Um, and then we, we do pay close attention to electrolyte monitoring for uh, in hospital patients, so the sodium, potassium, and chloride. Um, and uh, and that's a nice benefit of running repeated or daily ones. I hope that the follow -up the question. question. If not, so well, the follow-up question mm -hmm. is: Do you examine bicarb or base excess or pH in the venous blood gas? Um, we usually use base excess here um, since it's it should be less influenced by um, CO2 levels as opposed to bicarb, um, which uh, because of the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation will be somewhat dependent on CO2. And so base excess tries to correct for that. Um, so I would say I and most of the people here use base excess and re rely more on that. Uh, um, and next certainly question. monitoring the pH to see the primary disturbance. Uh, next question is, what is the appropriate time during CPR to consider the patient will be neurologically stable if ROSD? I think we, we don't exactly know that, and that's not really known in human medicine either. Um, one of the recent pa interesting papers that I read out of the uh, resuscitation journal in human medicine, um, there may be some promise looking at pupillary um, light reflex. Um, in determining neurologic outcome um, immediately after CPR. Patients who um, had a PLR had an excellent prognosis. I think six of seven of them made it to discharge um, with neurologically functional outcomes. Um, and those during CPR who had a decreased pupillary size compared to normal or increased also had a better prognosis. So I think that's something, either PLR or pupillography, um, is a direction that veterinary medicine could go to give us a better idea of neurologic outcome. Um, but other than that, I, I don't think we we really know a lot of the time what the neurologic outcome is going to be for our patients. And I certainly warn owners, um, you know, we give kind of the, we don't require our dogs and cats to do math or, or drive a car. Um, so, so some neurologic dysfunction is tolerable, but we don't know what that will be. Um, following CPR, um, what their level of recovery will be. And with a high number of re-arrests within 24 hours, um, I think even if you have an animal come back that's neurologically capable following its arrest, it, it certainly may not um, be that way over the course of the 20 hours. OK, it looks like there's one more question. Okay. Would you mind just reviewing the four different rhythms on the ECG slide with the bottom two being shockable rhythm? Yeah. Um, so on the, um, on the uh, defibrillation one here, um, going from top to bottom, the top we have pulseless electrical activity. Um, and so this can be variable in its presentation. It can look like ventricular beats. It can look like normal sinus beats. Um, but the difference is there's no palpable pulse in these patients. So the heart has some electrical activity, but it's not um, consistent enough to create a, a pulse. That one is not shockable. The next one is asystole, so your classic flat line. And again, that one is not a shockable rhythm. And then the bottom two are, um, are shockable rhythms. So the first one is pulseless ventricular tachycardia, um, and you can see that this kind of looks like a, a patient who has R on T ventricular tachycardia. Um, but the difference here is there's, again, no palpable pulses. Um, and so that is considered an arrest rhythm. And then the last one is ventricular fibrillation. And again, both of those are um, indications for defibrillation. That's all the questions we have. Uh, okay. Thank you, Dr. Wonderful. Wolf. Um, yeah, thank you, just guys. A couple, uh, just a couple comments. Uh, reminding that the CE credits will be, you'll receive a survey. Uh, return the survey, uh, we'll give you the CEU credits. We'd also like to alert people to know that if you're interested in, in additional or being invited to additional webinar content, if you visit the Nova Biomedical Dash webinar website, we have both 
upcoming and on-demand webinars uh, listed there so you could listen to at any time, including a, a webinar that was presented uh, a couple months ago by Dr. Wolf on blood gas sampling uh, in small companion animals. So that concludes our program. Thank you all for participating. Thank you, guys.